there. Thanks for tuning in. Torgo here. Welcome back to the Torgo Entertainment YouTube channel. Welcome back to another gig log. And at long last, I'm covering a gig log to show you how I host and prepare for team trivia. No way. You can't just quit on us, stroll up, and be welcomed back by everyone. Hey, welcome back, Peter. Flash, you're back to first alternate. What? I think I've promised many times over the years that I was going to end up doing a gig log for one of my trivia events. I never got around to it, and then I didn't host trivia for quite a while. But we're back, we're doing it, and this time we're going to have our first trivia back for 2021. Now this marks my 11th straight year hosting team trivia in the area, and by no means am I the only DJ in town doing such things. There's probably six or seven DJs hosting at various restaurants and bars in town every single week now. I've waited a while, and I'm not exactly keen to seeking them out as much as I used to be, primarily because I have my other job, and since trivia is a during the week kind of activity, I don't really want to be working 24-7. I want some sort of work-life balance, even though that's very hard for me to attain, admittedly. I used to have trivias Sunday night, Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night, and the first Friday of every month, and that was just insanity. I'm now down to one a week. And this time, we're going to have Tuesday nights, which I personally think is the best night for trivia. And we return to Tags in Big Flats, New York. Now, I had trivia at Tags last year for a 13-week period. Tags got a hold of me in the early summer last year, saying that they wanted to have some sort of activity during the week, not only to try and bring business in, which a lot of venues struggle to do, given the pandemic, obviously, but they knew that they wanted trivia. They've had trivia in the past, but they've always had a lot of trouble getting people to go. They kind of went with the Quizzo style or Geeks Who Drink, a national level, and they had trouble getting people to want to go to that. Because when you have a national level, you're kind of at the mercy of advertising because they market it to all of their people all across the country. And some people aren't into that. Some people really like the word of mouth or having some local business take care of it. So it didn't really work out. They gave me a ring. I ended up doing it for 13 weeks. Unfortunately, they had had a bit of a problem last year where they had to cut it early, but they said they were going to get a hold of me in April to try and start it again in 2021. They did. Here we are. Briefly, I'll show you the map to show you exactly where Tags is. It's 10 minutes away from Corning, right in Big Flats, New York. Yeah, we have some very interesting town names around these parts. And we're on the second story on the roof. That's what worked during the pandemic. We had open air seating, everyone seems to really enjoy it, and the tables were spread out enough. We can only fit a maximum of 12 or 13 teams there, depending on if they have another table set up at the base of the stairs. But it worked out for everybody, and the demand was there, so it's a good thing to be back. Now a lot of people have asked me over the years, how do I come up with Team Trivia? How do I host it? And I don't like divulging that many secrets of my trade, I guess. I have to admit, I've wrestled with the idea of doing a team trivia gig log for some time. Just because I hosted trivia for 10 years already. This is year number 11. One of the things I struggle with as a wedding DJ is trying to shake the notion that I'm just the trivia guy, you know? Obviously, we have weddings throughout the year, but you see the same people every single week. You build a rapport with these customers. When you DJ somebody's wedding, you're really gonna only see them once, twice or three times if you meet with them ahead of time. With trivia players, you see them on a weekly basis as long as they keep coming back, and it's kind of hard to shake that sometimes when you're trying to book other events. But it sometimes leads to people knowing who you are, and as long as they know you're a DJ, they'll book you for other things, hopefully. I have gotten a fair share of weddings from previous trivia players, as I've mentioned on this channel before. But enough history, how do you do the trivia game? I probably do it a little differently than everybody else. I'm probably a little more extra than everybody else that hosts trivia. But I'm gonna go through piece by piece how I handle it, and hopefully it benefits you if this is something you want to do. There's a couple things that you need to figure out before you even start the event. This is stuff that you need to talk with the restaurant that's hiring you. This is stuff that needs to be in your contract. Number one, the big one, how long do you have during the course of the night to host the game? I would say that the vast majority of trivia nights here last two hours apiece. Two hours seems to be the happy medium for how things work. I've had some venues do one hour or an hour and a half, and it goes by very quickly. I've had it last as long as three or four hours, and that's too long because then you have teams taking up tables, and restaurants do not want tables taken up from people who are not getting more food. You're not gonna continuously be buying food the entire four hours. 
Restaurants do not want that. They want a steady stream of income and they don't want to lose potential customers coming in when they don't have a table for them because they're all taken up. I used to have this problem at Applebee's all the time. So two hours. You also need to figure out what time you're having the event. This is crucial. I would say the best time to have trivia is seven to nine o'clock p.m. 7 p.m. is late enough in the evening where people will actually go where they don't have to work because if you have it too early, closer to six or even 5.30, people are gonna be rushing home from work. And if you're in a larger market, traffic becomes an issue. And people don't necessarily wanna rush from work to go do something else that's gonna rack their brain for a couple hours. And ending at nine o'clock, means that it's early enough where people don't feel like they're gonna be obligated to stay out too late and they can still go to work in the morning. The whole reason that a venue wants team trivia is to get butts in seats on an off night. If someone wants you to do trivia on a Friday night or a Saturday night, that means that they're doing something wrong. You don't want trivia on their peak night because then you're gonna conflict with a potential band coming in, you're gonna conflict with the bar crowd, and that's just something you don't wanna deal with. So you have your date and time set. Now you have to figure out what kind of format you wanna do. There's two formats more or less for team trivia. One of them I like to call the quizzo style, which is where they hand out answer sheets and it's six rounds, 10 questions per round. Quizzo hosts trivia at pubs and restaurants nationwide and they give you the sheets and they ask 10 questions in a row and then you hand in the sheet with all 10 answers on it and that ends the round. I am personally not a fan of that style. I feel like it's way too much work all at once and you get these short little bursts in between and I feel like it's way too much focus on what you're doing. People wanna be able to talk with others in their group. It's still supposed to be a good time for everybody involved. I don't like it being that intense. 60 questions is a lot to go through in two hours. It's not Jeopardy. It's a fun night out for your players with their family or their friends or their loved ones. So the way I do it, which is the way most people do it out here, is four rounds, five questions per round. You hand in an answer or submit an answer after every single question. That seems to go pretty well. And I would say you give players two to two and a half minutes to answer each question. For those of you who like to play a song in between each question, I almost never play a whole song. Don't let the song play out. You don't want to stretch the time out longer than you need because then you're selling yourself short. You say you're gonna be there for two hours and you might be there for 2.15, two and a half. You don't wanna do that. Plus, you gotta keep the event moving. If someone doesn't know it, they don't know it. That's the format that I use and that's the format that this video assumes you're gonna be using. Four rounds, five questions per round, so 20 questions, and a final question at the end, 21. It's actually gonna be 23 questions the way that I do it, but we'll get into that in just a little bit. So you have the venue locked, you know when you're gonna start playing, you need to come up with some trivia. How are you going to do that? There are tons of websites that show example questions, how to be a good trivia host and whatnot. For whatever reason, a lot of the material that you find online is very UK centric, which is perfectly fine, but it's not the same thing here in the States. So here's how I go about it. Number one, you need to figure out what you are asking. And you need to have a wide range of stuff that you are asking. A lot of trivias that I've been to in the past as a player will have theme nights where like round one will be all about a certain category, round two will be a certain category. I don't really like doing themed rounds at all and here's why. Let's say you're a player, you're playing trivia with a couple of your friends and we get to round number two, a five question set and the theme of the round is Disney movies, okay? Let's say you don't know anything about Disney movies. Let's say that no one at your table knows anything about Disney movies. So you're gonna struggle for like a half hour and that means you're not gonna have a good time and more likely than not, you're probably not gonna wanna come back. Like if you're having one of these events one time only, then maybe you can get away with it. A Harry Potter trivia would go off really well, a Star Wars trivia, an MCU trivia. There are definite topics that would work for that. But if you're gonna be recurring at a place week after week, I would definitely steer clear of the themed rounds and the themed nights. But what kind of topics are you gonna ask about? Well, it helps if you know what kind of people you're gonna get. And admittedly, this does come with time. A good jumping off place to start, and I would definitely not stick with this, but I would start very simply, look at the Trivial Pursuit categories, the six colored wedges, the blue is geography, the pink is entertainment, the yellow is history, the green is science, the brown is arts and literature, the orange is sports and leisure. Now, you don't have to do necessarily two from each and call it a day, I used to do that, but it's a pretty good start to show you that you need some variance. I mean, it's a pretty decent distribution, but so much of it goes untouched. Vary it up a little bit, and don't be afraid to go 
go a little heavier on the pop culture. It's not school. This isn't academic quiz league. You're not going to test people on chemical reactions per se. They're not going to remember 16th century dynasties. You have to make sure that it's mostly fun stuff that you're asking and not necessarily recall of education. Otherwise, you're gonna have students and teachers win all the time. And this is a big one, and I struggled with this when I first started. Make sure you ask stuff outside your comfort zone. If you only ask stuff that you know, that means your friends or people just like you are the only people that are going to do well. You always wanna give off the impression week after week that absolutely anybody can come off the streets, come in, and win trivia. Now besides categories of question matter, there's a couple different ways to write questions. 74 time Jeopardy champion Ken Jennings wrote in his memoir Brainiac about the nine different types of trivia questions that he saw as he was studying as he played at bar trivia. There's probably more than nine, but this is a good jumping off point. So I'm gonna be paraphrasing a lot from these memoirs for this next section. You can read into this a whole lot more. There's a lot of documented information about these types of questions. This is just a brief overview of the types of questions that exist in team trivia. Now the first type of question is your most basic information. It's just simple recall, and I like to call it plain old pancakes. Here's the question, give me the answer. Simple, basic, light, fluffy, falsely filling. Yeah, it'll fill you up, but you don't really feel that satisfied. It's like the old Mitch Hedberg joke. You come and you have to start strong, and you have to finish strong. Those are the tricks, right? You can't be like pancakes, all exciting at first, but then by the end, you're sick of them. <laughs> These are okay once in a while, but you don't just want to have simple question and answer basic commands. They're dry, and it's going to feel like you're taking the SAT. So instead, in order to jazz it up a little bit, we have question type number two, or as I like to call it, Pancakes with hot fudge. This is flavor. This is texture. This is stickiness. Hot fudge could be a supplemental fact added in the question. It may or may not be a hint, but it could be interesting. Not every fact is the most interesting in the world, so sometimes you have to spruce it up a little bit. Or it could lead to the answer. Maybe they won't get it one way, so they can get it this other way. A lot of people also use reference works like Guinness World Records to write trivia questions, which I'm not a huge fan on, but they do lead to question type number three, which I like to call the superlative. The biggest something, the tallest something, the deepest something, the longest something, the earliest something. People like knowing about the first time something happened. But what's better than the first time something happened or the last time something happened? How about the only time something happened? So that's kind of a subset of the superlative, and I call that trivia question type number four, the unique one. Which one of these 100 is the only one? Look at unique facts, for example, for all 50 states. It's a much more powerful question. Instead of asking the biggest or the largest, if you ask the only one of something, that always comes off as a little more of an oomph with that question. We go from the only one to a whole lot of something. With question type number five, the huge number. Alternatively, the jelly bean question. Guess how many jelly beans are in the jar and you win a prize? except it's not gonna be jelly beans in a jar, it's gonna be the population of a city. It's going to be, as a very trite example, the number of years between the invention of the pencil and the pencil sharpener. These kinds of questions I usually have a range with because asking somebody to come up with a specific number is a bit much. So you can give them a little bit of wiggle room and you'll still get it right. Question time number six is a personal favorite of mine and I like to call it the meaningless connection. Here's an example from Jennings' memoir of a meaningless coincidence. All four of the Best Supporting Actress winners at the Oscars from 1978, 79, 80, and 81 have MS as their initials. So you could ask for all four of them. It's a pure coincidence that they all do, but that kind of tidbit could lead players into guessing who they all are. And that is a meaningless connection. The question type number seven is something that a lot of players really seem to gravitate towards, and that would be the elusive everyday detail. Something that they see almost every single day. An example that I've used personally about eight years ago, there are a ton of dandy mini marts all throughout this region, and the logo of dandy mini marts has a man wearing a bowler hat. So I asked what color is the bowler hat in the dandy logo? I had 30 some teams that day, not a single team could guess that it was a gray hat. They all put black or red or yellow or any of the other colors from the logo that they passed by on a daily basis. No one could tell me that it was gray. 
that is an elusive everyday detail. Now you're probably taking notes wondering, well, do I need to hit every single one of these types of questions in a trivia? No, of course you don't. These are just examples to vary it up a little bit. You don't need to hit most of them, honestly, but there's one that I suggest you avoid and that's question type number eight, the classic, the trick question. The bane of trivia players' existences. You never want to seem as a host that you are misleading the players, that you are cheating them out of points. Here's a prime example. Question, who is the first female president of the United States? Now, as of this recording, we haven't had any, so it's a trick question. The answer is there is none. You do not want to ask trick questions. Instead, you want to do a variation of that. Question type number nine, the puzzler. The puzzler is a little harder to come up with, but oh man, when players get the puzzlers right, their endorphins activate and they are having the time of their lives. The feeling of reward and satisfaction after getting one of those types of questions, that's the kind of stuff that gets them to come back for more. So those are the nine types of questions. I'm gonna add a couple more to that that I personally like to do. This type of question very much depends on what sound system you are using, but audio clues always go over really well. People know music. Everyone listens to music. Only do audio clues, honestly, if you are bringing your own sound system. You never want to be at the mercy of a house sound system that's untested if people need to be absolutely listening in to try and make out lyrics, to try and get song titles for stuff they don't know. I ask for the musical artist, and I will tell them ahead of time if it's a solo male artist, solo female artist, band, group. My distinction is that a band plays their own instruments, a group does not. I then ask for the song title, and I do tell them the number of words in the title. Unless you're playing an instrumental song, in which place, you know, hey, you've never heard YYZ by Rush? Good luck figuring out that title. Hope you know Morse code. And then I ask for the year of release. And when I say year of release, I mean the first time it came out officially, either as a single or on the album, whichever one came first. Because sometimes singles come out far before the albums do, especially with newer music. So I look up both years and I just go with whichever one came first. And I always give a little bit of wiggle room there as well. I'll say plus or minus one on the year of release and you'll get it right. And that works because a lot of 70s music, you can tell it comes from the 70s. Same with pretty much every decade. So it gives people, again, a fighting chance. Another type of question that I do, not so much anymore, is the picture page. You've seen these if you go to sporkle.com or a bunch of other places. 12 pictures on a page identify these things. People like having different ways to answer questions. I've posted a bunch of these on my Facebook page that I've done over the years. I've done, I think, 700 plus picture pages at this point, because here's a spoiler alert. I've hosted 1,100 trivias as of this recording. I have never repeated a question, ever. Now, I don't really do picture pages anymore, and I'll get into why in just a little bit. And then we have the final question. Honestly, I treat this just like Jeopardy. Before the final question, you give the category of the question, allow teams a chance to wager. And then if they get that question correct, they get that many points. If they get it wrong, they lose that many points. Now, some places like to change the way people wager, or you can only wager five, or you can only wager a maximum of half. No, I like to say you can wager zero, you can wager everything and everything in between. Try to keep it to whole numbers. If some team tries to be cheeky and wager pie, unless you're running an Excel spreadsheet and you can put the numbers in real quick, it's more headache than it's worth. Just, you know, have them be reasonable with their wagers. And the final type of question, which I haven't really talked about, is the tiebreaker. Because you're inevitably gonna have a tie at some point. And unless you have a cash pot that can easily be split, you're gonna have to break a tie. Here's how I like to do it. This is where that question with a huge number comes into play. I'll ask a question with a ridiculously huge number or a ridiculously small number. I'll ask a question with a numeric answer. And I have all the teams participate whether or not they're in the tiebreaker. No one wants to see other teams vying for a prize that they're already ineligible for. So don't let them know who's in it and who isn't when you do this. But ask for the question. And if the teams that are eligible for the tiebreaker, if one of them gets it right, they break the tie. If a team is closest to that answer, they break the tie. The one caveat is if you have multiple teams get it correct, or if teams are equidistant from the correct answer, what I usually do is the team that submitted it first breaks the tie, 
but that's gonna be very dependent on where you do this because if you have a lot of space, you don't want people like running and potentially getting hurt for a trivia prize. But I've only had that happen once or twice in 11 years, so it's a very rare issue. But keep in mind, it could happen. So I touched upon briefly what types of questions to ask. Here's some stuff that I don't like to ask about. You may disagree, but this is just something I've experienced over the years. Number one, you really don't wanna ask about YouTube or Twitch or any user created content because it can change drastically. There's no authority saying what can or can't be in something. I make YouTube videos. You don't see me asking videos about my YouTube because nobody watches them. Plus that kind of stuff is easy to edit. You can easily add an annotation to a video completely debunking stuff. It's just way too much of a gray area and I don't think it's good for trivia content. Similarly, you don't want to do fan fiction or fan made content or unofficial content. Like, for instance, I'll ask about video games once in a while, like let's take Super Smash Brothers, but you don't want to ask about the hacks or the mods, because that's really niche. And unless you really know that kind of stuff, I wouldn't ask that whatsoever. It's just, it's best to avoid that kind of a topic. You don't really want to talk about spoilers for various media. I like to say there's a three month grace period. WandaVision just wrapped up online. I wouldn't ask about that anytime soon because a lot of people haven't gotten to it yet. You don't want to spoil a movie or a show for trivia players because they're going to get mad and they're not going to want to come back. Similarly, you don't want to ask about breaking news because not everybody is that in tune with what's going on in the political climate or what's going on in the local climate. You don't want to ask about current sports per se. And as a brief aside, if you're going to ask sports questions, which I recommend doing two or three of max in a night, make sure that your statistics are current because a lot of sports questions, their stats will change drastically, especially last year. The 2020 seasons of all the major sports really put a kibosh on a lot of different records. There's a lot of asterisks floating around. So just bear that in mind that with sports in particular, you wanna make sure everything is up to date. The vast majority of people do not care about the names of memes or their origins or what they're used for. So don't even, I, so I wouldn't even bother with it. And finally, obviously you don't wanna ask inappropriate content. If you're hosting trivia in a school, don't have a bunch of sex related questions. Don't get overtly political, don't get overtly religious. You don't want to offend anybody. It's okay to walk the line with edginess, but you don't want to flat out offend someone. Other stuff that you really shouldn't deal with, anything that's subjective, all your answers need to be correct no matter what. You don't want varying degrees of correctness. Asking about colors is a prime example of this. If the answer to a question is a shade of blue like a periwinkle, just take blue. If you're asking for school colors, for instance, I went to the University of Connecticut and their colors are blue and white. If you ask for the colors of the school, I would accept blue and white. Now that blue was technically a navy, so if someone says navy, that's correct, but if they say just blue, you got to take that as well. You can't be that pedantic with your answers. I would stay away from codes or riddles because that's not really trivia. Limericks and riddles, you know, that's from a book. You know, if they want to do that, they can stay at home and do that. Trivia has to have facts involved with it. That kind of teeters into the trick question category, which I said you should avoid. I would avoid having multiple questions in one. Unless the question asks for two of something or three of something, you don't want a compound question. You also want to make sure questions aren't too broad. Name a Canadian province. That's not even really trivia, that's just a task. Don't ask questions where the answer is an explanation. If you're asking how something happens or why something happens, I would steer clear of that as well. People like definitive who, what, when, and where. Avoid those other two questions of journalism. And finally, don't have homework questions for trivia. You're only gonna really see this at school or if you have a younger player base. Don't ask five questions about biology. People want escapism when they come to team trivia. It's not supposed to be work for them. So I've already written the question set that you're gonna see for the gig in this video. I'm gonna walk you through each question bit by bit and tell you why I think each question works. I always start my trivia sets off with a true or false question. That kind of allows players to ease into the game with an either or answer. I don't like to do that for other questions. This one is obviously pop culture related. The only act. So we have that unique one modifier going on in there. And this is a question that I've had to keep up with. I wrote this last year and then I had to keep up on it because they just announced the 2021 Rock and Roll Hall of Fame inductees. This question is false. 
It's actually Aerosmith. They're the only ones. Jaded was big in 2001 that was on the charts when they were inducted. But Ozzy Osbourne sounds like it could be. I chose that as the fake. He had that song with Post Malone a little bit back. And everyone can name a couple Ozzy songs. So I felt this was a really good fake in order for it to be false. Admittedly, I end up having a lot of these be true more often than I do false. So I wanted to lead off with a false. Question number two. Hello, dead great Deku tree. Fictional Bakers, 1968. People love brand names for question and marketing mascots. You would be amazed that people know as much as they do. This is obviously the Keebler Elves. It's a relatively simple question. It's round one. I think it's on the easy side. Question number three, we have a sports question. It has three different features to it. I like to make sure that there's groups of threes when you're giving hints in most cases. Center known as a pill, produced in Costa Rica, the material from the Jersey side of the Delaware River, I think, is you have to know that to be sure, but what else could it possibly be? This is a baseball, an MLB baseball. Question number four, Clarence from Wonder Shows and Patience. Oh, that's a good reference. Uh, card game, Europeans call Patience. Everyone I've asked this to has gotten it right. Uh, we call it Solitaire. This is that type one question. It's not particularly interesting, so I always try to have some sort of reference to a show or something kind of funny on the more basic questions. You have to be entertaining with every question. Moving on to the last question of round number one. Again, it's got the three different aspects to it. People that have body parts removed on three different television shows. Game of Thrones, Arrested Development, Prison Break. Obviously, they're all different genres of shows, but they all had hands forcibly removed. So that's a nice variance where you don't need to know all three of them, but if you know one of those cold, you're going to get this question right. Moving on to round number two, question six overall. This one's a little bit tricky, but animatronic is the key word to make things a little bit easier. Animatronic novelty gift shows that there's electronics inside it. It narrows down a couple of options. When I tested this, a couple of people said Furby. But 1999, I included the name of the restaurant, Flying Fish, which is not really needed, but I wanted to try and give people a Pavlov reaction when they heard fish, an animatronic novelty gift, to get them to guess Big Mouth Billy Bass. Make sense? I think so. Moving on to question seven. This is a case where I don't like to have the pictures give hints for the question because if you can't see the screen particularly well where you are sitting, it is an unfair advantage compared to people who end up sitting closer to me. Uh, the Black Canyon of the Colorado serves as the site of what famous structure. It's clearly on a river, so I feel like people would be able to suss out that this is the Hoover Dam site. I don't think the picture is necessarily indicative of that, but that is a picture of the valley prior to building the Hoover Dam. Question number eight, hello, Penn Gillette. Uh, I have a civil engineering degree, so every once in a while I like to throw civil engineer information in there because it's me. I know you said you can't really ask about stuff you know, but I do try to personalize these questions to some extent. And I thought it was fascinating that the nail gun was specifically invented for use on this aircraft and how many famous named aircrafts are there, you know? So this is obviously the Spruce Goose, the big one, that Howard Hughes had. Question number nine, bus service. I mean, name a bus service, but I included this stuff in the beginning to make it a little bit juicier. The largest bus company in the world. This makes it the superlative as well. You know, what's the largest bus company in the world? I don't know, there's so many to choose from. But mentioning that it started off over 100 years ago, it's American, it has sister companies that are also American Trailways, Indian Trails. My goal is to get people to figure that out and put it all together that it's Greyhound. I feel like that might be an easier option as well to guess Greyhound, but I wanted to throw in hints to really narrow down the options. This is the slide that I use for the audio clue. It shows that the three things that I'm looking for are the solo female artist, the two word song title, and the year of release. Uh, for this particular set, I do Try Everything by Shakira 2016. It's off the Zootopia soundtrack. And I like to give the peak position where it hit on the Billboard Hot 100, just to kind of cheekily show that I pick songs that people have heard before. This one peaked at number 63. I tend to have two songs, and the one that peaked higher would be earlier because therefore more people have heard it, so it's easier. And I'll show you why uh, that's not the case for this particular set when we get to the round four audio clue. Uh, after the half, we have question number 11. This is just suggestive. Disney Teeny Weenies. 
This is that flavorful kind of question I was talking about. You know, original name of a Disney movie. You have to throw in the year that it came out. You have to throw in that it's live action. I felt that if you had just said Disney movie, people are going to say, like, you know, The Little Mermaid or some sort of animated feature. But this is Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. It makes sense. You know, Teeny Weenies has the suggestive nature to it, but it also, you know, means something small. And I feel like people will be able to latch onto that. Plus, the year checks out. Question number 12. This is an example of a question with multiple answers that I think works. Acronyms and initialisms work really well for this. Acronyms are when you say the whole thing, like radar. LTE is an initialism because you have to say each letter individually. It's not LTE or something like that. Uh, and people like modern technology. I like to throw those in every once in a while. And everyone's seen this. This is one of those things, the recollection. Question type number seven, long-term evolution is what LTE stands for when referring to that 4G cell phone stuff. This icon in the bottom left corner is my range question icon. This is where the answer is a year, some sort of exorbitant number, and I don't want them to get it exactly right because I feel like that's a bit too much to ask. So I'm giving plus or minus 15 on this one. Everyone has seen this Kit Kat clock before. You might not have known that that's what it's called. And I gave a range of plus or minus 15 because it's round three, so I didn't want the range to be too large. But I always associate Americana in kitchens and inside houses in general with the 50s. And the answer to this question is 1932. So I wanted that range to not include the 50s at all because this is the second half of the game. So you have a range in 1917 to 1947, just kind of inching up close to the 50s. I feel like the range is wide enough where it's okay for round three. Question 14, this is a hard, not hard as in difficulty, but just hard as in firmly biology question but you know you gotta do once in a while just to change things up hopefully people will remember their animal cell organelles and this is a lysosome this is just you know it or you don't and it just has a little bit more information the loose body thing you know that's mildly suggestive you know someone's gonna get a giggle out of it especially that late in the evening people have probably had a few at that point but this is the lysosome they're the ones that are the waste material breakdown organelles you know someone's gonna say mitochondrian and be like this is the powerhouse of the cell which you know, no that's not what i'm asking and finally in round number three i wrote this set about a month ago upon making this video and this question kind of hits a little bit differently because of the answer sack lunch bunch is a netflix thing i don't know how popular it was i mean it was nominated for an emmy but that doesn't say very much i included the fact that he was a former snl writer to really try and clue people into the fact that this is john mulaney that i'm talking about and again john mulaney has been trending on social media for the past couple days uh, you know, he's now dating Olivia Munn, getting out of rehab and all that stuff. So that wasn't round four. I moved it to round three just because his name has been in the news lately. So hopefully his name will still be in people's minds enough where they'll know who I'm talking about. And now we get to the hardest questions of the night, my round four. Question number one around four is probably my favorite question I've written in some time because this is just one of those facts that you hear and you can't believe that it's true. This is one of those unique ones as well. How great is it that there was only one country in history that entered the Olympics under one name and left it as another name? I had to include that it's Africa. I had to include that it's in Southern Africa to really narrow down those choices because if you open it up to every country in the world, I still think it's a bit ridiculous. So really narrowing it down. If you know your African geography, you know, you can make a one out of 15 guess or something like that. Uh, the correct answer to this one is actually Zambia. It was known as Northern Rhodesia when it entered the Olympics. But right before that closing ceremony, they declare their independence as a lot of African countries did in the 60s and it ended up becoming Zambia. That's what happens when you have a lot of different countries owning a lot of Africa for the first part of the 20th century. A lot of political upheaval in that part of the world. Typically, you know, each of these things is worth five for the artist, five for the title, and 10 for the year in round number four, but it's worth 15 for the artists because this song has three different solo male artists that don't typically perform together. In this case, uh, this is All For Love, from 1993, the Three Musketeers soundtrack, so we're looking at Brian Adams, Rod Stewart, and Sting. Because it has more aspects to answering, because it has more points available, that's why I put it in round number four, as opposed to try everything in round number two. Even though this song peaked at number one, this is a number one hit song. So theoretically, it should be easier, but because it has five answers as opposed to three, I felt it belonged in round number four as opposed to round number two. 
Everybody likes food questions, and again, fast food, don't ask about it too often, but people know this stuff. Who invented the double cheeseburger in 1937? You had to include the year because you really want to rule out McDonald's from the 50s and stuff that came out more recently than that. And I really hope people recognize that this is Big Boy, Bob's Big Boy. I put it in round four because we do not have any Bob's Big Boys around here. So I feel like the answer is a little bit esoteric compared to what people have here. I mean, we, you know, we have enough stuff in the Twin Tiers, but Big Boy you don't get until you get out Ohio way. Wayne, who you've met on this channel, has a running bet with me that I always have to have one Pokemon as a picture on every slideshow that I do. Otherwise, I have to pay him some money, and I've been going 11 years, and I still haven't lost. I know Burpee is a very popular brand of seeds if you're a gardener, but not everybody is a gardener. So that's why I include 54 as the year for this one. It took 21 years, actually, for someone to collect this prize. But it's pretty hard, it's round four, because you really need to know your botany for this one. You need to know what flowers are in the daisy family. It's not an obscure answer, the answer is marigold. So it's something you know people have heard of. So that makes it a fair question to ask. If it was something a little more obscure, I wouldn't think this would be a good question. And the last regular question, we have an architecture question. This is not quite superlative, it's a little short of that. It's the second largest private home in the U.S. The Biltmore Estate in North Carolina is obviously number one. But we're talking Long Island, still in New York State. Popular hotel and wedding venue, kind of tying it in with the whole wedding DJ thing. This is Ohika Castle. Uh, it's also known as the Otto Kahn Estate. Sometimes you just gotta know it or you don't, and that's why it belongs in round number four. You know, some people may know this, it's very possible no one may know it, but you know, what can you do? For the final question category, I give wineries. I live in wine country in the Finger Lakes, as do all of my players. So every once in a while, you gotta throw them something that you think they should know. And I actually came up with this question as I was testing other questions for other sets. Um, we were talking about wineries, about what states had the most wineries, and I think I just made an offhanded comment about, does every US state have a winery? And they do. So I asked for the U.S. state that had the fewest wineries. Uh, I said that this has two wineries, but rather than make it a one out of 50 choice for the final question, I mentioned that word coastal in there, which really narrows down your options to fewer than 20 U.S. states to choose from. Still not sure if I want to toy with the idea that Alaska and Hawaii are not correct, and I kind of want to mention that because I feel like everyone's going to say Alaska or everyone's going to say Hawaii, which is obviously not correct. And the answer to this is actually, well, I'm, I'm not going to tell you. You'd have to look this one up. But I will tell you that the answer is not Delaware because one source that has this has Delaware with only two wineries, and that's not true anymore. They have since gotten two more, which puts them at four. So that's not correct. So this is a question where you really have to check your sources. So you have your gig booked. You have your material that you're going to be asking. What else do you need? Well, players need to be able to answer somehow, so there's a couple ways to go about it. For a long time, pencil and paper was the way to go. Make sure you bring a pencil sharpener if you use pencils. Make sure you have more than enough writing materials. And what I like to do instead of using loose paper or scrap paper, I like using sticky notes, honestly. Players like having the sticky notes all compiled in one piece. It's easy for them to carry when they collect it from you in the first place. And I would say, there's the smaller size sticky notes that are more than acceptable. You can use the full size post-it note size, if you will, but the smaller ones are fine for trivia. And make sure that they write their team name and their answer on each one. Unfortunately, in a pandemic, pencil and paper didn't work so well, so I had to come up with some sort of solution for how players can answer. I've alluded to this in videos in the past, I made an app. My friend Frank does coding on the side in addition to his IT job. So I worked with him, I told him what I wanted, and we came up with a trivia app that players can use. So when players come to Trivia Now, they pay me a cash deposit and I give them the tablet already logged in to the app. And this way they can play directly from there. They answer all the questions on their tablet, and on my tablet, I receive the answers and I let them know whether they're right or wrong right on the spot. I have a couple options that I could send them yes, no, prompt, which is quiz team parlance for needs more information, or accepted. I like to use accepted or acknowledged when they're giving their wagers or their final answer. I like to draw out the suspense of that final question. You know, make sure, don't let them know right away whether they got it or not. So I bought 16 of these tablets, and that's how many I bring to trivia. I know that I said I cap at 12 or 13 teams, but you know, obviously I'm gonna need more at some point when other venues start to open up. Because I'm using a web-based app, 
They need to have internet access. Now, a lot of places don't allow that many devices on the internet at once. So what I also bring to trivia is this little device. It's called a MiFi and it acts as a wireless hotspot. It's called a MiFi because it's through Verizon, that's my mobile carrier. Now you can run it off your phone, but phones tend to cap out at nine or 10 devices if you set it up as a mobile hotspot. And if you have more than 10 players, you know, you're kind of screwed. Whereas the MiFi allows 15. So that way it's more than enough. And if I need to have that 16th team join in, then I can run my phone as a Wi-Fi hotspot on top of that. And as another brief aside, when players submit their answers, honestly, don't ding them for spelling. Sometimes people only hear things phonetically or heard it on a show and they may not know how to spell it. As long as they're close enough with the spelling, you know, I think it should be okay. How do they receive the questions? Well, obviously you're gonna speak through the microphone and you're gonna hear it. But in addition to that, what I like to do is I bring a monitor with me to trivia. Now, if it's a bar or restaurant that has TVs, I like to jack into the TV and run the HDMI, so my PowerPoint presentation would be running on the screen the whole time. And another reason I like to do that is because this prevents people from asking you to repeat the question, which really just eats up time. If they have questions, they can just look at the question, look at the wording, and figure it out from there. But wording is important, and that's why every question I ask, I test trivia sets before I use them in real games. Go through all the questions, we make sure the wording is on point, and the wording is very important, and I'll give you an example why. There was a contestant on Who Wants to Be a Millionaire in 1999. He had this question come up, he answered it, it was wrong, but as it turns out, none of the answers were right. It said what instead of which. If it was which of these four, then he had a fair shot. But because it's what and the correct answer is higher than all four of those, which is the case here, there was a potential that he could have sued. He tried, but it ended up not working. And on top of the spelling, you know, you don't want to make the players feel dumb. Obviously, they're not going to know some things, but you don't want to rip on them for spelling because it makes you come off like you know more than they do, which is hard enough as it is because you do know the answers to everything, but you don't want to rub it in their faces. Light ribbing is okay, especially after you build a rapport with regulars, but you do not want to come off as condescending. And after testing all the questions, that's when we sort them by difficulty. If more people got a question correct after testing it, it goes in the earlier round. If fewer people get it, then it goes in the later round. Also try to avoid having the same category appear multiple times in the same round. You can ask two or three sports questions, but have one in each round. Don't load round number two with sports questions because it's gonna get monotonous. And honestly, that's pretty much it. You know, you can work with the language and add humor to suit your particular style. I'm not gonna sit here and tell you what style I use or what I think is right. I just do it the way I do it and that I've done it forever and it seems to work for me. But again, it needs to be your game. I will mention that if you are only stating the questions out loud and not using a PowerPoint presentation, which is perfectly fine, but make sure your questions are a little shorter than they would be if you had it written up for everybody to see. You don't want to have people remember or write down an essay for each question where there's no reference to what you even said in the first place. There's probably some information that I'm missing, but I hope that this gives you a good jumping off point for if you want to host trivia in the future. As for right now, we still have a gig log to get to, so we need to get going. I'm going to show you the equipment that I use when I set up at this trivia. I hope you're ready. Let's go. So taking a look at the aerial photograph of tags, it's kind of hard to tell what's going on in this photo. There's a lot of parking, but that dominant parking lot on the bottom of the photo is not where I'm going to be. Let's put the white star where I'm going to be set up, bam, right there on the roof. So that rooftop area right there, that's where people will be playing. It's kind of L-shaped. It goes, uh, you know, northeast and southeast of that star, according to that photo. And this white line represents the staircase that I have to use to haul my equipment up to get it all set up. Here's a little bit of video of it. Sorry for the bird poop on my car. But yeah, it's pretty steep and there's a camel up top. Now being peak dinner time for tags, I didn't want to have a video camera out running around filming everything. So I ended up just getting static images. They provided the covering over the table and they provided the table as well. 
So we have my two QSC K10.2 tops. You've seen those in many different gig logs. Regular speaker stands, and we have the black scrim over those. Just because you can kind of tell by that hand on the right side, that's where the staircase is. And just because those speakers do not fit under the awning, I need to have the scrim on there to, just as a safety thing so people cannot trip on my speaker stands. On the table itself, from what you can see, we have the television. It's an LG TV. It's 40 some odd inches. I used to use my 40 inch Samsung TVs, but those I like to stay in my house. And spoiler alert for an upcoming gig log, I have to purchase some more TVs for a wedding I'm doing in July. I have to throw a lot of the equipment, unfortunately, just under the table, but nobody's gonna be coming up to me anyway, so that's not as big of a deal. Moving to my view of things, we have my coffin, you know, the Pioneer DDJ SX2, which you've seen so many times. On top of that, we have my Samsung Odyssey notebook with a trackball mouse, the SanDisk solid state hard drive, and on the right is something new. We have a new variation of the power bar, which I now keep inside the same case as my controller. And that is for something you're going to see in a little bit. You got, you know, the power con connecting into that. On top of that, you see my MiFi plugged in, that white power cord. That is for my tablet, my Samsung tablet, which I usually run my DMX Go off. But instead, that is my receiving unit for people's trivia answers. We have a clipboard underneath there. The envelopes are for deposits. I collect a $20 deposit from each team because I'm giving them a tablet. And that is what I use to hold it. It's not as much of a big deal anymore with COVID restrictions lifting, but I still do it anyway because I don't like touching money all that much. On the right side of the coffin, we have my old laptop that is what has the trivia score sheet on it the excel document i don't like running everything on one laptop for trivia there's the tablet itself and at the bottom of that we have a brand new thing my sure slxd microphone this is going to be my main reception microphone for weddings i didn't wants to have to bring my giant mic case should I not need to for various weddings like the one I'm going to be doing later this week and I got to tell you this thing sounds really good it's a beta 87 microphone and it just feels good in the hands I like the way the power switch works on it it's just very good I love this microphone and I bought a case for it as well Moving over to the other side of the controller we have you know some electronics wipes my IPA alcohol that I used to wipe down all my tablets. And there we have eight different tablets that I bought. And that is what the players get to play trivia on. Each team gets one. That's what they have to pay the deposit for. And we have some chamois there that I use with the alcohol to wipe everything down to make sure it's nice and clean because people are kind of gross sometimes. And looking at the bottom slash back of everything, we have my Allendale Defender holding those wires because we have my power strips there, uh, one on each side of the table just because the wires run a little easier. I know it doesn't look great, but it's, it's trivia. You know, you don't want to tape everything down. They really do not like gaff tape on this wood for whatever reason. We have my power bag. Everything is in the splitter, my two foot extension cord, and that is the power supply for the entire event. I have my Yeti battery in the car should I need it. I just didn't want to haul it up if I didn't need to. The skinny orange rigid case is what holds all my HDMI cables. The larger orange case just has knickknacks that I use for trivia, you know, headphones, envelopes, all that good stuff. We have two toolboxes just in case something should break. I ended up not needing them at all. Laptop case and that Weiss bag, that grocery bag is what holds all 16 of my trivia tablets as well as the MiFi receiver. And I know this isn't really a gig that's gonna have footage attached to it, but that's okay because I'm not gonna have to level up at all because it's not like there's a common rider out there that's trivia based, right? Right? And that's it. That's how I host Team Trivia, but I hope this one helped. I hope you maybe learned something. If you like the trivia question ideas that I have, I'm Torgo with Torgo Entertainment, and we will see you at the next event. Take care.